And then keep in mind that the child is also not coming readily to Sunday school. How many children go to Sunday school happily with their desire? Dad, dad, mom, get up, get up. It's 9.30. We've got to go to Sunday school. We've got to go to Sunday school. How many times do you hear that? Zero. Zitch. Nah. It's the other way around. Get up, get up. We've got to go. We're getting late. So the reason I bring this point up, for Sunday school teachers, the biggest challenge is to bring a unharmonious child into harmony in the class. Number one, they don't want to come to Sunday school. Number two, their parents force them in the car on Sunday morning. And especially as they get, especially the boys, as they start getting older, this, the NFL thing, the NFL syndrome kicks in. Say, so, oh, I'm gonna miss my, 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 my game. And then so many things happen that makes the child very, very reluctant to come. So we as teachers, as Sunday school teachers, we have a huge monumental task, gigantic task, of bringing this child who hates coming here to make them love in the class. Like the sister said, that when you're not interested in a subject, your mind is not there and you want to cut. So there are many kids in Sunday school, they would make an excuse, can I go to the bathroom? And in the excuse of bathroom, they're roaming around the corridors, they're roaming in the cafeteria. You don't even know what, how long they take in the bathroom. You're thinking they're in the bathroom. Because we have the benefit of doubt. We think they're honest. But you find out later on, oh, they were strolling outside in the parking lot. What are we doing here? Uh, the bathroom got extended. <laughs> That's what one child told you. So it's very important that we, as teachers, understand this concept of ulul al-bab because we will be sincere in teaching only if we have a passion, a desire to teach, not forced to teach. Not because my mom and dad are telling me that I got to volunteer in Sunday school. Not because I want to do it for just uh, uh, volunteer credits from my high school or college. But rather, you have a desire to instill and imbibe in the next generation. Teaching is a very virtuous act because you are forming and cultivating a personality in front of your own eyes. People who you teach in a Sunday school, they remember you forever in life. How many times you will see that you are at a wedding or at a, some gathering and a child comes up to you, you were my Sunday school teacher at MCNJ. You taught me that thing, you taught that. You, want, you may not even remember the child, but they remember you. Because there's an Arabic saying that goes in Arabic, the memory during young age is like a carving on a stone. These young little minds that we're teaching in Sunday school, we are carving their personality, we're carving in stone. So they remember what you say, what you do, everything is copied, everything is registered, and they memorize it. So we have to instill in them the concept of tafakkur tadab. Like I said, number one, they don't like coming to Sunday school. On top of that, learning Quran, Tajweed, Qirah, and then Islamic studies and Sirah, ah, oh, it's just dull, boring. What's going what am I gonna get out of it? Many of the uh, criticisms <coughs> I've heard from kids saying, why should I go to Sunday school? What do I get out of it? What's my objective? Well, why do you go to regular school? Well, that's, I need it for a career, for a life, for a job. This won't get me a career, job, or life. So kids are very relentless in terms of learning. And that's why we as Islamic school teachers or a Sunday school teacher, we have a, a huge responsibility to make the subject matter enticing, attractive. Make them magnetize that they would love. And yes, like I said in the beginning, no kid says, get up, get up, we go to Sunday school. By that same matter, there are many children in many masajid Sunday schools that look forward to Sunday. I know one family in Tindek that their kids would always, always wake up their mom and dad Sunday morning and hurry, 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 we gotta go. And they would not go on Saturday nights to any parties or any wedding, anything, because tomorrow we have Sunday school. That was so dedicated family. I was like, wow, we need to salute this family. You're like a role model. A family not going on a Saturday night to a wedding party. Why? We have Sunday school tomorrow. I remember my wife invited them for dinner on a Saturday. They refused, we can't come. I said, wow, so dedicated. More than I am, actually. I confess, I like to go on Saturday night somewhere if somebody invites me. But I'm not saying that that is something to be done. But that showed the devotion and dedication. Today, those kids are in their 20s. MashaAllah, some of them are married. Beautiful family and beautiful future family. The three kids have blossomed into beautiful individuals. All of them are 
fully engaged in massages. That reminds me that 20 years ago when they had such a strict schedule for Sunday school, they had a passion. Sunday school only thrives through passion. None of you are here because you're forced to come here. Each one of you have a desire and passion. I know Brother Najib always has that dunda on top of your head. He says, okay, okay, you gotta teach, you gotta teach, you gotta teach Sunday school. But the fact of the matter is, deep down in your heart, as bad, deep down in your heart, you have a desire to contribute to the Muslim Ummah. Because nobody can force no one to teach on a Sunday morning in school. It comes from the heart. And for that, you know, kudos and you know, congratulations and very, very, you know, it's very, very heartening to know that there are individuals who want to sacrifice their Sunday morning moms and dads and, you know, siblings and others who would like to come and help. So one of the things that is very important and when it comes to Udu al Bab is uh, the uh, concept of being habit forming. See, what you teach your kids in Sunday school, it becomes their habit. Many adults say, my Sunday school teacher taught me this. My Sunday school teacher showed me this, or told me this, and it registers. So we've got to be very careful what we are teaching, and it's authentic, it's credible, it's supported by Quran and Sunnah. It's not like a bidah, it's not something that is a weak hadith, or it's something that is unauthentic or inauthentic, whatever the case may be, because that will then create more problem for that young mind, because that young mind will become an adult, they'll keep registering that thing. Now, what is the purpose of Al-Bab? That Allah tells us in the next ayah. That Ulu Al-Bab are those people الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقَعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَإِذَا فَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ سِمَاتُ الْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَ سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا هَذَا بِالْنَارِ This ayah is the deep core crux, pivotal issue of ilm, knowledge in Islam. Any knowledge in Islam that we teach, the purpose is to make them remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembering Allah doesn't just mean you say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, akbar. Remembering Allah, yadhkurun Allah here also means that the knowledge that they acquired, they processed it, they digested, absorbed it, and then did what? Transform their personality. No knowledge is good if your personality is not changing. No knowledge is good if your character is not improving. No knowledge is good if your behavior doesn't enhance, become better. How many kids, they enter Sunday school in kindergarten or pre-kindergarten, they exit Sunday school by what, 9th, 10th grade, and they're still the same. The same bad habits that they entered at age 5 or 4 is the same bad habits they have at age 15, 16. What did they get out of Sunday school? Zero. Now, is that the fault of the teachers? No. Is that the fault of the school? No. Is that the fault of the system? No. Where is the fault? The fault is in the communication. And that's what we're learning here today. How can we communicate better to the kids in class so that they become individuals who have refined their personality, who have changed their personality. They become a better human being, better individual. Because Sunday school cannot make somebody totally Islamic. It's only two, three hours a day on a sun, on a once a week, you know, and that also uh, roughly what 30 weeks 32 weeks in a year you have that minus the holidays and other things so you're almost about 24 26 weeks in 26 weeks of two or three hours you can't carve a personality even the Islamic schools are struggling who have full-time Islamic schools five days a week they can't carve out personalities I've taught in a Ghazali high school nine years myself nine years back to back straight from 2009 and I could see kids high school kids ninth to 12th grade totally totally out of Islamic character at that you know, parents are thinking I'm paying $500, boom, they go in this building, they come out like a product of a factory, refined. But I know how many times their child curses, how you know how many times their child watches things that are totally, totally uh, unethical. But the parents are in oblivion. So character forming comes from the passion of the teacher, how to instill and imbibe in that person and the desire for the person to change. And that can only happen what Allah says in this ayah. That Ulu al-Albab are those people الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ They are constantly thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ 
When our, although Allah says here that they think about the creation of the heavens and the earth, but it really extrapolates to everything. That they think about their wujud in this earth. They, they think about their existence. Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? What am I doing here? If we can teach these little kids who then grow up to be big in, on Sundays that you have a purpose in life. Know your purpose in life. You have a mission in life. Understand your mission in life. You have a goal to achieve in life. Aim for the goal of your life. And you have a target to reach. So reach that target. These are four things we have to do for the kids. Hmm? Know your purpose in life. Okay, that's very important. Understand your mission in life. Purpose is different. You understand the purpose. That translates into mission. And I know my purpose. Now, how can I make it a mission? What is a mission? It's your daily struggle, the daily grind, in and out. Once you know that, then you also have a goal to achieve. So I need to know where, what's my goal, Jannah. And I have a target. The target translates the goal on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. I need to get to Jannah, but this is my lifespan, age 0 to 70 or 60. I need to achieve that target within that lifespan. And that's how it happens. So what are the characteristics of people? What kind of children we want to be, uh, be, become in a Sunday school? That they are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, just not the physical dhikr of subhanAllah alhamdulillah, but also contemplating on the knowledge that they're acquiring. Con- contemplating on the Quran that they're reading, contemplating on the meanings of the surahs that they are memorizing contemplating um, on the Islamic studies uh, chapters and topics that they're being taught, contemplating on the seerah of Rasulullah if, if that is being taught in the Sunday school, contemplating that how can I apply the seerah of Rasulullah in my personal daily life. Then only you can see people of al that they use the knowledge, ponder and think the fakwa tadabu, and then they apply it in their life to reach that, okay? So inshallah, I'll, I'll send this to Brother Niaz, the PowerPoint. He'll send it to you in WhatsApp, so you'll have that. You don't need to write it down. So one of, like I said, having a purpose of life, and the most important thing is having taqwa. The real root of the knowledge of Islam is to build taqwa. Taqwa in the heart and mind and soul of the person. That, that these kids become more muttaqi. And what does it mean to become more muttaqi? When you start seeing the child, oh, we're not allowed to do this. My teacher told me this is haram in Islam. Or my teacher told me this is not appropriate in Islam. Restraint. When the child begins self-restraint, as young as five and as old as 15, you know you've got, you did your job right. Because if the child doesn't have self-restraint, if the child is still very, very, how should I say, stubborn, rigid, timid, the child is very, very aggressive, you know, um, uh, boasting, that means we have an instilled taqwa in them. The opposite is that child is self-restraining, withdrawing from all munkarat, from all evil, from all ism, all sins. And visually you can see that in their language, in their body language, in their, you know, other aspects of it. And one of the most important things, which is that the goal of Islamic knowledge is to make selfless individuals. See, kids, when they come to learn in Sunday school, they're coming from the system. Remember Five days a week, they're going to public school. And they're not going to uh, Islamic school. That's why they're coming to Sunday school. So five days a week, day in and day out, they're being brainwashed, programmed, with all the kharafat, with all the bad things that's going on in public school. We all know. We've gone through that. So for five days of that poison and venom that's feeding into them, and then two, three hours on a Sunday to debrief them, debug all of that. The antidote is not big enough for the poison that is being injected in their minds and souls. So what do we have to do? We have to always have a positive attitude towards everything. One of the biggest mistakes that I've seen many Sunday school teachers done, male and female, young or old, being very, very critical of the child in the class, uh, either privately or publicly, taunting and teasing. Children run away. You'll stop coming to Sunday school. There's nothing binding on them to come to Sunday school. So one of the biggest tasks we have, the biggest burden we have as Sunday school teacher, is to make it so playful, joyful, attractive, that they desire to come to class. They want to go to Sunday school. They are not turned off. And usually the first, when somebody's teaching first time in Sunday school, they are very critical of the children. They're very... um, 
comparative, like they compare, oh, look at him, how he's doing it. Oh, look at her, how she's doing. Please do not compare children. That's the first thing of teaching 101. Do not compare kids, especially in class, in public. That's the biggest turnoff for the child because they'll just become shut off, introvert. They will not open to you. We have a job to do. We are building the future of this community, the future of this masjid. These kids will, inshallah, tomorrow, will be the people who caretakers of this masjid. So we need to raise individuals. You know, we see about adults fighting, adults having disagreements, adults, uh, you know, having a ruckus in a masjid. Where do, these kids one day will become adults. If we don't teach them today, if we don't train them today, tomorrow they, these same boys or girls will be moms and dads and fighting in the masjid. So we failed in that context. So what do we need to do for them? Always be optimistic. Always have a positive attitude towards everything. Even if the child dropped something. Even if the child didn't do their homework. Even if the child came late. Even if the child came sloppy, dragging his backpack, which is all broken and torn. Be positive in everything. Because that is what Ulul Al-Bab do. See, Ulul Al-Bab, like I said, the deep core thinking. What does deep mean? They look at the bigger picture. They're not focusing on this child, this Sunday school, this class. They're looking, this is a product of my ummah. This is the future of my ummah. So if I keep a healthy, positive attitude on this child, he or she will, inshallah, grow up to be a positive individual. The ayah that is telling us from this Ulul al-Bab, that yutafakurun fi khalq al look what the question Allah says. Allah says that they say a question, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batila. Oh my Lord, you did not create this world in vain. Purposeless, aimless. Subhanaka. Glory be to you, Allah. Meaning you created this beautiful world for a purpose. And they're trying to understand what's my purpose in this life of this beautiful world. And that breeds optimism. Being optimistic. Being positive in everything. The biggest danger we have is being negative, pessimistic. Or you're no good. I think you should stop coming to Sunday school. I'm going to talk to your mom and dad. You're just wasting time here. That's going to just kill the spirit. It's going to kill the soul of the child. So these kind of things should be refrained from. We should never say that to a child. Rather, if the child is not performing, we need to boost them up, uplift their morale. Show them positive words, compassion, mercy, love. Maybe even sit after the class next to them and, you know, put a hand over their head and say, look, you, you can do it, Mira, Bidi, you know, you, Yabini, Yabinti, you can do it. You are the, you're the star of the class. Oh, really? Am I? Children are very, very pessimistic by default. Let me tell you that. I've been teaching 22 years from experience, I can tell you. Children by default, whether full-time school or part-time Sunday school, they are always pessimistic. They don't believe in themselves. They have no confidence. Because they come in as a three, four, five-year-old child, and throughout the system, they're being condescending, they're being criticized, they're being discriminated, or they're being criticized with people. So they lose confidence. The biggest job of any teacher, whether volunteer teacher or paid teacher, is to build confidence. Yes, you can do it. I know you can do it. It's You got this. You have it. You have the talent. You have the skills. Really, teacher? You think so? Yeah, I know. I can see it. I can see the bright future. You're going to be this in the future. You're going to be the star of this ummah. You're going to lead. Like there was this one child, I remember in Tina, when I used to teach in Sunday school, he said, you know, brother, I want to be the president of the United States. I said, yes, why not? And there were kids laughing in the class. I said, hey, be quiet. Why are you laughing? What's the, what's the joke? What's the fun? He wants to be it. He will be it. You have to believe in yourself. And now that person, he ran for the township council uh, last year. And uh, he got into the council. So he's going climbing up his ladder. You know, 20 years ago, he's a small kid. He said, I want to be a president of the United States. He is on that path to going. Why? Because we believe in them. We instill positivity. That is what Ulul Al-Bab do. They bring positivity. If, if, you, if you be positive and act positive, that's all you need to do as a teacher. Simple. First rule of teaching, just be positive and act positive. Leave the rest, it will come through. Because that, because you know, in teaching in Sunday school, it's not like a professional job that is part of your career. You're going to become a career teaching like an Islamic school or some other public school. So the thing is that a lot of times we are not uh, aware of many of the pedagogy and the other stuff that's going on in the classroom. So it's very important to understand just one thing, that we are here to be positive. 
We're here to be optimistic and we will deal with everything in a positive manner. Negativity is not part of any school. Negativity is not part of any teaching. Negativity is not even in the Quran. Allah talks about insan in the Quran. So many ayat, so many surahs. Did you ever see Allah talk negative about insan? He always talks positive about insan. Yes, there are ayats that Allah warns about Jahannam and punishment and things. But the goal Allah always shows in the ayat, you, you can do it. Come to Allah, ask forgiveness, repent to Allah. You know, Allah is forgiving, Allah will forgive everything. What is all of that? That's positivity. Don't give up hope. Don't be hopeless, you know. Don't be sad and depressed. Allah says, Wala tazan. Do not be sad and depressed. Hmm? You know, that's what Allah says. So that is very important to understand. Let's go to the next thing. Any questions so far? Yes, please. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to ask you was, so I gave you a handout of Ulul al Bab teacher. Let's focus on that. Okay? You, are, you heard and understood what Ulu al-Bab are. Now there are Ulu al-Bab teachers and there are Ulu al-Bab students. The teacher's goal is to make Ulu al-Bab students, but they can only make Ulu al-Bab students when they themselves become Ulu al-Bab teachers. And here, they're very self-explanatory. One of the most important thing is being committed to the work that we're doing. We're not doing this for someone, we're not doing this for the mother, we're not doing this for money, we're not doing this for parents, we're not doing this for any other stuff. We're doing it only and solely, purely for Allah SWT, ikhlas. For any Sunday school teacher, the most important ingredient necessary is ikhlas, khulus, khulus of niyyah, khulus of their goal, desire. And remember, when you are committed to work, when you have ikhlas and khulus, automatically with that will come compassion and, you know, passion for the work, you know, always being enthusiastic, positive energy. When you welcome the child on Sunday, you as a teacher yourself should be smiling, hustling, bustling, you know, and, you know, your body language, your facial expression should give the impression to the child, the child is coming droopy and lazy and... and <laughs> and meets a teacher. Habibti, <laughs> mashallah. Your voice, your pitch of tone, your action, your body language wakes them up. It's like, oh, my alarm went off right now. That is positive energy. I know some of you might be laughing and saying, what kind? I'm teaching you the real nitty gritty details. Because, you know, 20 years of experience, it's a plethora of things. I've seen things, I've seen Sunday schools where teachers, go on, get in the class. Yalla, hali, 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 get in the class. I don't want to get in the class, I want to go home. Mama, I don't want to go to Sunday school. I'm not, when I give these examples, they're examples of real life teachers that I've seen do, because I've been to many Sunday schools as a teacher observer. Observe their class, give them feedback, you know, sister, you did this wrong, you did this right, you did this positive, this there, brother, you did this right, this is wrong. So enhancing the teacher is very important throughout the academic year. It's not just, and that's what I was telling Brother Ozer and uh, Brother Amjad that, you know, this is just the beginning. I would love to do this kind of training throughout the Sunday school year, once in a while, here and there. And I would also like to uh, teach individuals during the Sundays when I observe the class and look how you, because your growth, your success is our success. We're all one team. We are one masjid, MCNJ. So it's not about who succeeds, who, who fails. It's we all succeed together or we all fail together. And alhamdulillah, this is one of the best Sunday schools I can tell you being an outsider, now that I'm insider. As an outsider, because I remember that one of the first days when Brother Yusuf Ramzan, may Allah have mercy on him, one of my, one of my best friends, who always dragged me and pulled me to MC Sunday School and his dream was that I teach here. I saw him how he built with the other brothers, you know, not mentioning names, all the brothers and sisters and also with Kosar Vavi and how his wife, they built this from day one from scratch, from, you know, back in the 90s. So, and the name of this Sunday School has reached all the way far north. I remember back in 2005, 2006, when people would be moving down south here and they would ask, you know, where should I settle down, which area? And I would say, you know, if you want, you should settle around the Fords area. Because back then the masjid was not here, but the Sunday school was still there. 
and many people would come back and say, yes, that is a very good Sunday school. This is 2005, 2006, long time before that. We're in 2022, alhamdulillah, we have grown. So it's very important that we have this positive energy towards kids in the school when they're coming in the morning. And of course, like I said earlier, don't speak negatively about them. Be always encouraging. You know, appreciate diversity means whatever suggestions and feedback your students give you in class, accept it. Questions, they have a lot of questions. Don't bury the questions. Make a system where they can ask a question and you can answer them. Because not answering questions in a Sunday school class, whichever the class is, whether it's Sira class, Islamic studies, Quran, or anything, it will just keep that question in their mind rolling and then, and then they would not um, be positive again to ask a question. And one of the most important Ulu al bab teacher are that they have a very high threshold of tolerance. Tolerate everything. Don't react, act, don't react. Because reaction breeds more negativity in society, in the classroom itself. So that is very important. And then you foster caring nature. Um, This is very important, number three, that's on the list. I'm not going through every point because you have the notes, you can read through at home later. I'm just going through the main points. Interaction is very important. The class you're teaching should be very interactive. Because te uh, students here in, in this country, when they come to class and they're silent for, for 30 minutes, how many minutes is the class? 50 minutes. 50? Minutes. Five, zero. Five, zero. Five, zero. Five zero? Yes. <sighs> that's a long time. We, we got to talk <laughs> because attention span of kids shuts off after 30 minutes. You know, teenage masjid, they, they used to have 50 minute classes. They now cut it down to 35 and they've seen the results coming. So that's another discussion for some other day. But 50 minutes is too long. And in 50 minutes, if there's no interaction, because remember last night they went to the Walima and he came back at one in the morning and they haven't slept. <laughs> So now it's very good. Teacher, you go, continue. 50 minutes of lorry time. <laughs> so it's very important. Salman, did you understand that hadith? Aisha, why is she calling my name? Sumbul, did you get that point? Huh? So one of the ways to make interactive is to get to know your names of your students in the class and call them by names. I can't emphasize enough how many students have come up to me and say, it means a lot. You memorize my name on the first day of class. I say, yes, what's so big deal about that? My chachu doesn't remember my name sometimes. <laughs> my khala doesn't remember my name. And you, my Sunday school teacher, you remember my name first day of class. This is kids' reaction I'm talking about. Kids are very smart and they'll give you love. They'll give you commitment when you approach them with their name, when you deal with them in an interactive way and you communicate with them with respect, oh, it goes a lot. Many teachers complain about discipline. Oh, this, students are very, very indisciplined. We'll, we'll come to that slide. That's another topic that is part of this workshop about classroom management. How do you do classroom management? And the teachers who complain about discipline, I say, you know, the reason you're complaining, sister or brother, that there's no discipline in your class, is because you're not communicating properly with respect to the child. I could tell, there's a litmus test because what goes around, comes around. If we as adults and teachers give respect and high respect to kids, they will be obliged to, to reciprocate that. Rasulullah said in the hadith, Man lam yuwakil kabirana wa la yarham sagheerana wa wa laysa minna. Whoever does not yuwakil min tawqeer, whoever does not respect and honor our elders and doesn't shower mercy, yarham sagheerana. So what is he telling us, the elders, the adults? Have compassion, have raham, raham, have rahma. You know, the more rahma you show, that's a way of showing respect to the individual, the youngster. And they will give you back what? Tawqeer, wiqaar, you know, honor. Yes, I love that teacher. She's always positive. I love that teacher. He's always respectful to me, never. Even if I did something wrong, he would be very polite, very gentle. Hmm? Very gentle is the word that many kids use. From the ayah in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Al Imran, Rahmatim Minallahi Linda 
وبما رحمة من الله لنت لهم ولا كنت فضا غليظ القلب لا ينفض من حولك. الله is saying about Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in this ayah as a teacher, Prophet as a teacher, Allah is talking about him that from the رحمة of Allah, you are Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم لنت لهم لن لين means kind, gentle. It was the mercy of Allah that He made your heart, Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, so soft that you were gentle and kind and inclined towards them. For if you were, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, with a stiff heart, ولا كنت فضا غليظ القلب, if you were having a stiff, hard heart, لا ينفض من حولك, they would have run away from you. How many times kids run away from teachers? It happens a lot. We did so many times when we were kids, because we could sense that. Rigidness, timidness. Teaching, teaching cannot flow from one soul to another soul without lean, shafaqa, mahabba, uns. You know, gentleness, kindness, love, compassion. Rasulullah, when he was teaching the Sahaba, he showed so much love, so much compassion. Even the people who were badtamiz, you know, who were sul adab, like that famous hadith when a man came, Rasulullah was sitting in a majlis, and there were all Sahaba were there, and he was talking about. A, a topic, and a man came, Badu Arabi came, and he came in the masjid, he saw people sitting, he just stand over there, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-sa'a. Just like that, no respect, nothing, no ikram. Imagine a kid today in America in assembly school telling that to a teacher. Uh, Sumbul, why should I come to Sunday school? No Miss Sumbul, no teacher, no staza, nothing. <laughs> she she would be probably freaking her slippers. What, what sandal did I wear today? Yeah, that's the right one I got today. For this blatant child that's asking, for <laughs> pronouncing my name. That's what this person did. Rasulullah ignored him. The Rawi of the Hadith says, the man repeated again. He ignored him. He's not even responding. Ignoring him. The third time. And the, the, the Rawi of the Hadith said that we, our blood is boiling, man. I want to shut this guy down. Oh, he's so disrespectful. And the man who's teaching himself, the Prophet, the Nabi, he's so calm, so cool, no anger, no resentment, nothing. After the third time, the man got his message. Okay, I'm not going to get an answer. He just sat down. He sat down. He was ignored three times. He got the message. This man, whoever is he, because he didn't know who he did. You know, he didn't know the respect and honor for a prophet, you know, the dignity. He just sat down. But subhanallah, glory be to Allah on our beloved prophet Muhammad sallam. The rabbi of the hadith says when Rasulullah finished his kalam, when he finished his hadith, when he finished his talk, what he's talking about. He said, Ayn al-sa'il, where is the questioner? He remembered that somebody came and he asked a question in the middle of my class. And he ignored it. And he asked three times. But look at the compassion and mercy of Rasulullah. He said, where is the question? And he thought, the question thought that, oh, it's all gone, forgotten about. Ha, huna, huna, I'm here. And he asked the question about the sa. Well, his question was, when is the qiyamah coming? When is the day of judgment coming? So it's a long hadith, you know, we don't have time to go through that. But the reason I mentioned that incident, because that shows the compassion and mercy from the teacher, Muhammad Sallallahu himself. We are all ummati of who? Muhammad So our role model as a teacher is who? Muhammad So it's very important that we communicate with respect and show compassion and show mercy even if the student is very, very bad discipline or things like that. Because they will learn discipline one day. So now, the other thing is very important that we motivate the students and the co-workers. You know, a lot of times Sunday school teachers may be feeling down. I don't feel like going to teach today in Sunday school. But they still go, no, I have to go because, you know, Najiba is going to get very upset, you know, Niazba is going to get very upset, I'm going to get a phone call, so let me go, inshallah. By the way, <laughs> no harm meant for you, I'm just using names. For you. It happens to be your name is like that, but I was using for some other person his name. And then when they come into the school, another teacher notices, oh, my sister is not feeling well. Or oh, my brother, another brother notices. My brother is not feeling well. Just by the body language, the facial is, are you okay? You know, so motivating your co-workers, motivating, yeah, I'm thinking of quitting, you know. I don't know, should I go and tell the principal, I don't want to come from next Sunday. No, don't quit. Instead of saying, yeah, I, I'm thinking I should quit too. Let's both of us go today now. 
Liquid <laughs> without coming next Sunday. Instead of doing that, Ulul al Bab teacher are people of deep core thinking. They are looking for their fellow mates and colleagues that, hey, you feeling down? I'll lift you up today. Tomorrow, when I feel down, you lift me up today. That's how we work together as a team, cohesion. One person's feeling down, other one lifts them. The other one feeling down, the other one lifts them. Not that they both become pessimistic. It goes back to what I was saying before that being optimistic, being positive bring that positive why energy. You walk into any Sunday school of any masjid on a Sunday morning, you can tell if there is positivity in this Sunday school or not. Whether you go to MCMC, ICHA, you know, MCNJ, Dalur Islam, ICPC, any Sunday school, just take a stroll, walk in. You can feel the positivity why climbing out from the classrooms and the corridors and the parents, the cafeteria. It's like, wow, I want my child to be here in this Sunday school. It's a collective effort. And that positivity has to be in the atmosphere. Because if pessimism gets in the atmosphere, it's like a virus, coronavirus. It'll just kill everybody then. Not literally, but metaphorically, it'll just kill it. If you want to read a good book, as a side, I don't know if you are into reading books, but I always encourage people, especially teachers, I encourage them to read books. Because reading books enhances your brain. It enhances your growth. One of the very good books to read is The Secret. To find the secret, read the secret <laughs> by Rhonda Bynes, R-O-H-R-H-O-N-D-A, um, Bynes. You can just Google it, just type in the secret Rhonda, it'll come up. Nice small book with a red color in the middle. It's a very small, nice book, only a few chapters. But I went through the whole cover to cover of the book and I came to this understanding. What she is saying, what Rhonda Bynes is saying is basically Ulul al -Bab. She says that each one of us, I'm just giving you the khulasa, conclusion of the whole book in a nutshell, but you should read the book because it will re you really enjoy the book. It's an amazing book. She says that each one of us, she's not talking about religious people, she's talking about individuals, human, insan. She says each one of us as insan, we have a magnetic charge. Either it's positive or negative. So optimism, positivity will breed positivity. Pessimism, negativity will breed negativity. If I'm negative, I'm going to come here and talk pessimism and negativity to this brother. He's going to feel, saying, yeah, you're right, brother Jawel. Okay, then he turns to him and says to Mirza, the same thing. Yeah, then Mirza, and it's like a domino effect. And the whole group is negative. And the opposite, she says, if we bring positivity and positive energy, and we give that positive vibe to another individual, they receive it, they get that magnetic charge, they give it to the next one, and then the next one, and the whole group is positive. That reminded me of Rasulullah and Sahaba. That's how they were. Rasulullah is the magnet in the middle, Sahaba around him, revolving. In every battle, they were always positive. Even in Uhud, when his teeth was shaheed, and they were thinking, the Sahaba were thinking, it's, it's God. Rasulullah read, read positivity in Uhud. He says, started saying one loud word, Ana Muhammad, Ana Hai, Ana Muhammad, Ana Hai, I am Muhammad, I'm alive, I'm alive. Because rumors start spreading in the battlefield, Muhammad Sallam died. So just one slogan, one word, start breeding positivity. They regrouped, regained, and repelled the Quraysh back to Mecca. You know? So Rhonda Barnes says something which is exactly in line with our Islamic philosophy, our Quran. It's, it's, it's a shame that a non-Muslim like her, she knows we don't know this. We have the Qur'an. We have the Sunnah. We should be talking about this. Some Muslims should have written about this. And that's what she says, the secret. The secret to success, she says, is this positivity and positive magnet charge that each one of us possess, and we can rub it off and on to others. And that happens in real life. Don't you see that? When you come to Salah, five daily times Salah. Why Rasul said to the men, come to the Masjid, five daily Salah. You come to Salah, even if you're feeling down, you're depressed, you have some sad news, you come to the masjid, you pray with your brothers, and you meet them, you socialize, you talk to them, suddenly you start feeling good, relieved, better. Same thing with sisters, they come and meet sisters in the masjid, positivity, that's what she's talking about. So we move on quicker, I know time is running up. Um, the other very important point is that, you know, you put effort, number five, Bring a wide variety and range of skills and talent to teaching. So if you are a Sunday school teacher, my biggest advice to you would be read books on the side. Don't just come to Sunday school to teach what your syllabus is, what your curriculum is, what your course book is, you have a book to teach. Read things from the side also because teaching is a good way of enhancing knowledge. 
You can't teach unless you reach. That's my coin slogan, all right? It's copyrighted, don't use it. You gotta pay me $500. It's uh, royalty, because... Oh, what, what did I say? What's my slogan? See, you forgot. <laughs> you don't want to pay? I'm already pushing it. Huh? You can't teach unless you reach. Reach what, you might ask. Unless you reach that knowledge, you can't teach that knowledge. So you have to first reach, meaning acquire and reach. So as you are learning as a teacher on the side, I always say to people, you know, many times brothers and sisters come up and say, how can I enhance my knowledge? I said, become a Sunday school teacher. Brother, I'm asking you how to increase knowledge, not how to teach. I said, no, once you become a teacher, you will start reading books, you start acquiring, preparing lesson plan, you know, curriculum, syllabus, tests, quizzes, this and that. You will research, you will go online, you will get a lot of knowledge in. Once you take things in, you can put out. Because an empty brain doesn't give anything out. So it's very important. Next one, number six. This is one of the most important things, leadership. You are preparing the future leaders of the Ummah in Sunday school. I know it sounds like a very far-fetched goal, but this is a reality. Whoever we are teaching, they're going to become a Muslim doctor, a Muslim physician, a Muslim technician, or a Muslim engineer, a Muslim software programmer, a Muslim accountant, a Muslim nurse, a Muslim businesswoman or businessman. It's all Muslim, some profession. And that will help grow the Muslim society in America. And it will advance the Muslim community in America. So we have to instill in them leadership skills, even right from the 35, 40 minutes in a Sunday school. And that can only happen when you be proactive and not reactive. Whatever they do, whatever they say, be proactive for them. You know, instill in them. Imbibe in them the targets, high achieving targets. Yes, go get it. You can do it. Take this initiative, take this role for that. And remembering to always having that trust. Stephen Covey has a nice book uh, called The Speed of Trust. If you ever get a chance, read that book. Very nice book. This book basically talks about how you can build trust in relationships. Teacher-student relationship is also a relationship of trust. The more the student trusts you and the more you trust the student, knowledge flows and grows so he talks about there's a there's a bank account for trust and he says you have to deposit in your bank account of trust and it works it works in any relationship husband wife relationship uh, parent children relationship teacher student relationship sibling relationship in-laws relationship you know how after marriage in-laws become a big problem both for male and female if the husband is there his in-laws big issue daughter is there or the wife is there her in-laws that's a very nice book. You shouldn't miss it. Speed of Trust. You can just Google it. It's on Amazon also. And Barnes Book. And many of the, th I'm, what I'm amazed when I read these books from these non-Muslims, what I'm amazed is what they're seeing in there is in our hadith on Rasulullah. It's in the Quran. So what? If only they say Shahada to become Muslim. So it's very important to have a learning, trusting environment with your students where they have their always encouragement for growth, you know, positivity. And of course, very important, last but not the least, foster critical thinking. Whatever lesson you have planned, always during the lesson in the interactive, pose questions. Provoke their thinking, the more they will think. See, back home in the, our Muslim countries, the concept of teaching was memorization, you know, ratification, memorize, just memorize loads and loads of pages memorized. And that really never helped. It never refined the character of the person. What really helps the person is you foster critical thinking. What you teach, make them also question it and ponder and think. That's what that's what Ulu al -Bab people are. They are people who instigate thinking, pondering, tafakkur, tadabbu, that the child thinks about that Sirah chapter they learned about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The child thinks about that adab, the etiquette in the Islamic studies class that they learned. The child thinks about that Tajweed rule, that why is Ghunna over here? Because they'll remember that the Tajweed rule more if they do critical thinking on the rule itself. If they just memorize it, okay, when the Ba is here and the Ming here, we're gonna do that. If they just memorize that, they might forget when they're doing the practice of the Tajweed. So everything we teach in Islamic uh, Sunday school environment, it has to be in a, in a critical thinking format that the child thinks that. 
So, oh, let's go to now. Any questions so far? No question. No question? No, sir. No? I thought okay. I did good or did very bad. Did very bad. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, what is the lunch time? This is a question. There's lunch? I thought there's no lunch. It's here at your home. Who said there's lunch today? Yeah, uh, that is Okay. Now we come to the topic of tarbiya. All right, so that's teaching and uh, the teaching characteristics and all that. What is tarbiya? I told you earlier there is one thing called ta'lim from ilm and there's one thing called tarbiya from rabb. Hmm? Murabbi. Ta'lim, ilm is acquisition of knowledge. You acquire knowledge. You know, pages and pages of information just entering, entering. Ta tarbiya is now working that knowledge in the shakhsiya of the insan that this whole six foot, five foot body becomes to change. Taghayyur. Ilm yataghayyur al insan. Knowledge changes the insan, the ruh. That's what Rasulullah did in Mecca. They were idol worshippers, worshipping statues. He brought Quran, Wahi from Allah, Ilm. And then he worked on the souls. The same people who were burying their daughters alive, they were now ruling the whole world. Khalifa to Can you imagine? People burying daughter alive. Ignorance. Height of ignorance. Height of hatred for your own blood and flesh. But look what knowledge ilm did to them. Tarbiya. Not knowledge, just knowledge. Tarbiya. When that ilm was acquired by these people who buried their daughters and they worked with that ilm on their shaksiya, on their personality, Allah elevated their status and rank. They became Khulafa al Rashidi. That famous incident you may heard in many times in history of Umar ibn Khattab. When he was crying one time in the masjid as a khalifa, and somebody asked him, he says, I'm remembering the days of jahiliyyah, days of ignorance, when we were so ignorant. He said, what do you mean, ya Amir al -Mu'mineen? He said, we used to bury our daughters alive. And look, today Allah has made us khalifa to the earth. We have the whole command of this earth. We were desert nomad tribal people. We knew nothing. And Muhammad came and taught us ilm and brought us away from jahiliyyah into ilm, into tarbiyah. Huh? And that mentoring. So what I'm trying to say is that the purpose of tarbiyah is that you refine the shakhsiyya of the insan. Like I said in the beginning, if the child enters Sunday school and lives there for 10 years, every Sunday coming for 10 years, let's say so to speak, and after 10 years, they're still the same bad habits, the same bad character that they had 10 years ago. What did we give them? What did we give them? Just bunches of papers, exam, tests. Oh, you got 99. Okay, very good. What's the big deal? But my character didn't change. My akhlaq didn't change. I got a 99 on my seal. I got a 99 on my Islamic studies. I got a 100 on my Quran. My Quran is giving, mashallah, bravo, 100. But I curse, I cheat, I deceive. There is no khuluq. There is no tarbiyah. So biggest thing that we have to do in Sunday school is having meaningful, purposeful learning, effective learning, you know? And, and, and for elaboration of these points, I have sent Brother Niaz, I think he forward to you all. There's a very nice PDF um, article called the Tarbiyah Project. Please, when you get a chance, read that. It's about 14, 15 pages. By, by Dr. Uh, Dawood Tawhidi. Back in the 70s, he worked very hard on the Tarbiya project right here in Philadelphia. He was a Sunday school teacher. He was a professor in Temple University. He used to teach in university, and he used to teach on Sunday school. He came up with a curriculum back then, late 70s, and he wrote this uh, thesis. This was his doctorate thesis, the Tarbiya project. He goes into depth in detail how you can instill Tarbiya in awlad. So I'm just giving you a, a, the, the crux, the top of what his uh, thesis is about. So one thing is very meaningful, and the student should feel that they're content, what they're studying is worth learning. Remember what we said, cutting class in the beginning? Why do kids cut class? They have no, they have no worth in what, how they're spending their time inside the classroom. They'll say, oh, I'm, I'm better off outside. 
So when they have a purposeful, meaningful, worthful learning taking place, they will never cut class. They won't even want to go to bathroom. I remember once in this school, the boy was constantly on the chair going like this. Salman, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as the, the bell or whatever, the, the, they, they had the system over there to announce the classes, if the period is over and I've changed, Salman got up and said, shh, he didn't even ask him. Where did he go? Yes. Bathroom. Yes. And you asked Salman, why did you keep, keep holding it? You could have just asked the teacher. No, she was teaching very important thing. And I did not want to miss that. Kids are very innocent. You know, when you give when you, these little kids, I mean, I love teaching. I mean, I, I'm by profession a teacher. You may have a second. When you listen to these young voices, you feel so, I get really excited when I meet kids and youth, uh, you know, in Masjid or anywhere. The answers they give you are so, so genuine and authentic and innocent. And it's very, very eye-opening. I learned from Salman, from his answer, the look, if the teacher is teaching something very, very valuable, he will delay going to the bathroom. And how many kids always want to go to the bathroom? We just start, all right, open up your books, please, page number four. Yeah, what's wrong? Bathroom, which we didn't even start. Yeah, but teacher, why didn't, and now here comes the reactive teacher. Why didn't you go at home, huh? Your mom and dad don't let you in the bathroom, or you only got one bathroom in your house? Is that a problem? Why should I interfere in somebody's private business you got one bathroom or two bathrooms in the house? That's not my job as a teacher. Again, I'm not criticizing any Sunday school teacher, but these are real life things that have happened in a Sunday school, and we need to learn from others' mistakes, Then that's not a good way of teaching or taunting or criticizing the child. Because if the child has to go, it has to go. Do not stop them unless you think that they're just fooling around. That's a different issue. Then you have the principal, vice principal, administrative thing that you can use that. Integrated. Whatever we're teaching, make it very integrated in their life. They feel like I can apply this, I can do something with it, you know? It has to be engaging for that. Because if they learn abstract knowledge, yeah, this hadith is there. Thank you, teacher, teaching me this hadith in the Islamic class. Oh, this uh, incident of the seal of Rasul, you know, when he was carrying the bags of that old lady. Yeah, thank you for teaching me that. But what's the integration in my personal life? What do I get from this hadith? What do I get from this incident of Rasulullah? What do I get from this ayah? What, what is in it for me? And that integration has to come in your lesson planning. The night before on Saturday night when you're planning your lesson for tomorrow, Sunday, you make main points. You know, some other day we'll do a workshop just on lesson planning. How to make a beautiful lesson plan. Because the most strongest weapon teachers have in classroom is your lesson plan. If your lesson plan is awesome, you will never have discipline issues in the class. No fidgeting around, no nothing, because you're just going with the flow and your lesson plan is all programmed to finish in 50 minutes. Class is 50 minutes, so the lesson plan is designed in such a way it'll finish in 50 minutes. Because there's no filibuster in lesson plans, you know that. You know what a filibuster is? Come on, are you American citizen? Do you take your oath? Do you get a blue passport? You should know. What is a filibuster? Like a delay to hold up time. To fill up yeah, time. that's what Congress people do. Congressmen, Congresswomen in the Congress in Washington, D.C., they put filibuster to delay the bill to be voted for to be passed because they just want to elongate it. Senators do that. Third, very important, like I said, value based. That whatever we're teaching is part of the adab, akhlaq of their daily life. And there should be an observation that, in, in that the teacher is observing that things are progressing and changing. The adab, the akhlaq, the khuluq of that child in your class throughout the Sundays is improving. So four, four Sundays ago, they were here. Four Sundays later, they're here. Five Sundays later, they're here. You know, another 10 Sundays later, they're here. If you don't see that akhlaq progressing, that means our teaching has some hole in there. There's, there's value missing out over there. Kids get bored very fast in class if there's no challenging stuff. So it's very important that in your lesson plan, there should be things that challenge their knowledge, challenge their intellect, challenge their talent, and challenge them. Because if it's, even if one thing is challenging, it will make them think a lot and examine and, and be more prepared for the class next time when they come next Sunday. And very important to be active. Active in the sense that 
they translate the learning into actions. All right, what is the take home task from this lesson today class? Tell me. So one boy or one girl raise their hands that we can do this from this thing. We can do that. Very good, practical, pragmatic solutions. Extract it from them. Instead of you giving them the activity, ask them what they can do from this lesson that they just learned in there. And like I said, of ulul al deep knowledge. You know, make them ponder and think. Of course, they're not going to do the homework because it's, that's the tradition. Sunday school kids never do homework. You ask them every Sunday, do you do the homework you last Sunday? No. Nah. So give them homework that is practical, not more than writing and all that. Because if they implement those practical steps at home, learning takes place. Learning doesn't just happen when you have lined paper filled up every Sunday and you mark and grade that. It's better to have a practical homework where they come back next Sunday and say, yes, I did this in my home the last six days. I did this with my dad last six days. I did this with my mom last six days based on the lesson we learned last Sunday. And the parents will also appreciate that. Wow, this Sunday school teacher is very pragmatic, very productive. Because instead of giving just loads and loads of paper of homework, my kids are practically doing something. There's an activity taking place at home. I give you one example. There's a hadith that we teach in Islamic studies in manners and akhlaq a lot of times, um, especially the kids, young kids, the hadith of Rasulullah that if you look at children, if you look at parents with a smile, you get the thawab, the ajr of a hajj and umrah. All right, so if you teach that hadith in a, in a class to the kids, give them a practical homework. That from Monday, you go today Sunday, from Monday till Saturday, I want every day you applying this and having a chart how many times you did it. And come back next time and tell me. Whoever has the highest number will get a prize, surprise. And so they come back next time and say, teacher, teacher, I did 15 times, I did 25 times. You have, and they're gonna like, now this competition rivalry breeding in them. And the parents are so happy, guess what? And they're getting kids, hugging them, kissing them, smiling at them. I said, why are you smiling so much? My Sunday school teacher told me in the Hadith of Rasulullah that if you smile at mom and dad, I get the sawab ajr of hajj and umrah. So I want to get the maximum reward. Mommy is so happy. I wish I could meet this Sunday school teacher and hug her myself. Because she's changing my child. They're doing something practical, pragmatic. And that's what the higher order thinking is. Higher order thinking means that where do you take it to the next level? What we learn here in class, how we can increase it, and in, in, in the form that it becomes something productive for future. And that's where the child will begin to think like Ulu al -bab. Yes, we can do this. They begin to give you suggestions in class, outside class. We can do this, we can do that from this thing that we learn. And, and you can incorporate their suggestions into a group exercise in the class so that Islamic studies becomes a meaningful project-based learning as opposed to just things that we learn together. Now, last but not the least, very important. What kind of student is in your class? Take a moment and read through us. This is from years and years of experience in classroom. What I want you to do, because you've been a very silent lot this whole morning, and I've got tired talking to her. It's not my style of talking like this. I used to do interactive. But now my question to you is, read each one of those lines and tell me if that is correct or incorrect. If it's incorrect, tell me where I need to make the correction. Mind you, this is a brain exercise. So you have 60 seconds. Please turn off your cell phone, Sanjay. It's off already. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You're doing 60 second exercise. <laughs> You're not doing the homework. I mean, the classwork. 60 seconds now. Let me start with you, Nasibai. Tell me where is the first mistake. <laughs> Tell me where is the first mistake. No? Okay. Any sister, brother? So. Yes, brother. I would say the. Work first, play later versus play first, work later. Even the very active, engaged students 
if they have the opportunity to play, they would play first. You mean you switch this, right? Yeah. Very good, Masha. Brother Ahmed, right? Yes. Montez. Anyone else? If you need more time, you can take. Oh, my show guys, see him, brother. See him, man. Brother, see him, yeah. uh, I would say want the free, want the freedom to be spontaneous. Yeah. What about? I would say every kid just likes the freedom to be spontaneous, regardless of if they're good students or. So you you think good students also do that? Yeah, I think so. You sure? Give me your proof. You like look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been your student. <laughs> yeah. By the way, Brother Azim has been my student way back from Jersey City. When I had to teach in the, the Masjid in Jersey City. When was that? 2003, I think? Okay. Wow. <laughs> Arabic class. He was my first Arabic student. Oh, but he's a too old. Very old. <laughs> no, no, he was a small five-year-old. Oh, okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? The brothers have answered. What about sisters? Hmm? Not enough parathas today in the morning? Or so omelet? Yeah. Hmm? Yes. I'd say they're not spatial casual. They just kind of sit back and they don't really teach much in class. Right. So it fits over there, right? Is that what you're saying? Or is I'm that saying wrong? that there's also lazy, lazy students that just don't talk. They're not even playful. They just kind of just teach themselves in class. True. So many lazy students would do that, but many of them also don't do that. They're not playful or casual. Okay, well, time is running out. Well, we have to stop by Zohar, right? Yeah. We have like what ten minutes. I need to go through one more. <coughs> How many of you said you're doing the first time teaching? Huh? One, two, three, four, five. Eight, so, eight. do you know anything about classroom management? Okay. Let's do it. The, this one, the other senior teachers can help me around because they know what classroom management is, right? This is your spine, your backbone of teaching in any class, classroom. If you don't have this, you can't be a teacher, okay? What is classroom management? Well, there's a quote by Witchcraft, Mr. Forrest Witchcraft. Very meaningful quote. If you, as a, not as a teacher, if you as an individual, as a shaksiya, are important in the life of a young child, you have achieved your goal as a teacher. Alas, that's the best thing you've done. Don't worry about how many exams you had to grade. Don't worry about how good a teacher you were or what the kids thought about you. If you had a purpose and meaning in someone's life, you did it. You, you achieved it. Alhamdulillah. So, what is classroom management? A lot of times people say it's effective discipline, but it's more than that. It's not just disciplining the children in, inside the classroom and they're sitting together or separately, or whatever the case may be, but it's more in terms of we, the teachers, are prepared for class. I can easily tell a teacher is prepared today for class or not, just by walking in the door and seeing him or her what they're doing. It's so easy to detect. Because an unprepared teacher, number one, as soon as anybody enters to observe the classroom, like principal, vice principal, or someone, they become nervous and jittery. That's the first sign they're not prepared today. Because you are cool as a cucumber if you're prepared, well lesson, lesson planning, well prepared, all everything in and out, on the fingertips, you know? So it's very easy. And of course, if you are motivating the, ch the children, the students in the class, that means you, have a, you are well prepared too and you're providing a safe, comfortable environment for learning. What does that mean? It means that you are not wasting time in disciplining the child on the chair or the table. It is estimated by educationist gurus that a teacher that spends 10% of her class time, at least 10% of her class time, just Disciplining the children in class, that means they are not prepared. Because our time as a teacher in class should be going into teaching, learning, progression, not in just disciplining them. We're not there to discipline the child. 
because that is secondary. That happens automatically when you manage the class. When everything is laid out, the step-by-step -step thing, what we're doing today, what we're achieving, what's the project, what's the exercise, what's the topic, what's the subject, everything is laid out. That, that classroom management is so beautiful that discipline doesn't even take any time. And if there is anybody, like we said, the lazy students, if there's any lazy students trying to disrupt the, ch uh, the classroom environment, they will automatically be absorbed in it because the progress is going so much. So it's very important to understand that. And most important thing in a classroom management setting is that you build the self-esteem of your students. They feel important in life. Never discredit anybody in the class because everyone is valuable. Even the underperforming, less performing child in the class, even they are valued. You want to have an example? You know, there are many dropout kids who never pay attention in class, but they end up becoming, becoming very good doctors and engineers. And sometimes their teachers are surprised, how did you become a doctor? In my class, you were always not paying attention. Well, because they were very hyperactive kids. They had attention span issues, and you know, and they had issues with focusing on things. But that doesn't mean they didn't have intellect or, or talent or brain, mind. Just because a child is not paying attention in class doesn't mean they are brainless. They have a brain. It's we who have to engage into, in their brain. And that can only be done by creative, imaginative lessons. If you see 50% of your class is always fidgeting around, knowing, remember paying attention, improve your game. Improve your game means improve your lesson plan, is improve your planning, your productivity, your design of the class, the, the chapter that you teach, improve all of that, you will see that these, these same kids who were not paying attention two Sundays ago are now not just paying attention, but they are now creative, coming up with creative ideas, solutions to it too. So that's very important. Um, Why is it different for everybody? Every child is different, right? In the previous slide, I showed you the, the, the good student and the lazy student. So why is it different for everybody? Does everyone learn alike? Everyone learns differently. Some may learn through um, reading. Some may learn through memorizing stuff. Some may learn through practicing something because the brain registers in different ways. So each one has a different learning habit. Your adaptability as a teacher, I know it's a Sunday school, so it's volunteer based, but your adaptability as a teacher to different learning styles of students will increase your classroom management. You'll be better managing the class if you are doing that. So you have to sometimes vary your teaching style. You can't have the same teaching style on Sunday, September 11, until Sunday, May 24th. Every Sunday is going to be very different. If, if you are doing every Sunday the same thing, there's something wrong in your teaching style. And many Sunday school teachers grow up and blossom to become a full-time teacher in, in regular full-time schools. Because they started off their career as a volunteer in Sunday school. They went through this process and processes, and they liked it, they loved it, and they liked the interactions. Hey, I can do something. And then, by nature, they go into that line in their career. Remember the personality of the students, their attitude, you know, uh, in the class that are there. Um, of course, not every management strategy will be working. You have to keep trying different strategies for different students. Some students, they might be uh, changing their seating arrangement, helps grow their learning process. Some students, you shift them to the front, they are much better paying attention because when they are in the back, they're not paying attention. Some students, they like writing stuff a lot. So you give them in that strategy. Some students, they like to uh, memorize stuff a lot. So that's going that, in that direction. We'll pause writing as well.